those that are joining now, um, we're going to wait until half past six before I start yakking. And um, so if you want to go and make yourself a cup of tea or whatever between um, uh, now and half past six, please do. Um, um, the way we'll work it is I'll talk for um, however long it takes and then we'll do questions. And the best way to do questions is put them in the chat box. And there is um, uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little box that's with a speech bubble and um, uh, and it comes up there. So do put questions here um, and then and I will pick up on them. I will pick up on them when I have finished speaking. Okay. And um, the questions can be anything. It doesn't have to be about the subject, although probably, and I'll just try and go through as many as I can in the time that we've got. Okay. Mm. So I hope you can all see the webinar chat box um, that I will keep an eye on. So I put my little bit in there. So if you want to have a practice right in there, you can have a practice right in there. Um, um, uh, but I say, we'll just give it a few more minutes. The shameful thing is I can't see you when I do my um, online Zoom sessions. It's much more fun being able to see everybody. Um, but uh, hey-ho, um, I'll have to... All I can do is see myself, which is terribly boring. <laughs> okay. So another couple of minutes. If anybody wants to put any questions in the chat box before we start talking, then type away. I'm here, twiddling my thumbs. Oh, okay. Oh, I beg your pardon, chat is disabled. Okay, I've now found the, the um, let me see if I can enable it. Oh, not sure I can do that. But anyway, it's come up in the question answers. Okay, so forget that. Um, um, forget the chat box. I've got the question. <laughs> I've got the question answer box. Then put in the question answer box, and um, I won't type the answers because um, I'm such an awful typist. That will take all day. So um, um, I'll so say put them in the question answer. But thank you for pointing out that I'm incompetent. I knew that already, but sometimes I have to be told. Um, Okay, so some of the questions there. Do you use low dose naltrexone? Yes, I do. And I can show you how you can set that up for yourself and we'll come on to that in the practice. Okay. Um, okay. So Michaela Smith, how do you know if we have a chronic infection if the doctor says the bloods are fine but has slightly raised inflammatory yeah, so Well, that's a very good question. I hope we will answer that. Um, um, but... You know, basically, if you're not responding to all the energy delivery mechanisms, the history suggests that your illness was triggered by an infection and you've got symptoms of inflammation, which may be local or systemic, then it's very likely you've got a chronic infection. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, um, we've all got chronic infections on board. And if your immune system is in tip top shape, we can deal with it. Um, but don't worry, I will come on to that. I hope, Michaela, as we start talking. Okay, Valacyclovir or Zavarax, we'll come on to that. Caroline Beattie, is iodine 1 to 10 in coconut oil okay to use in ear to fight ear infections? Absolutely. Hi, Caroline. Came on my um, EK Med weekends um, and taught me a lot about the law. Thank you, Caroline. Um, okay, AM still, okay. Testing, testing. Oh, Craig's test. Okay, well, I think Craig will stick with the question and answer because I can manage that. Virginia, why is it difficult to tolerate vitamin C? I can only tolerate one gram of sodium scorbate. I don't know. I would love to know the answer to that. I mean, the, the, the vast majority of people tolerate vitamin C absolutely fine. Um, I can. It's possible that you can be allergic to it um, because most vitamin C is derived from corn. So, um, Virginia, it might be worth you trying a, um, a vitamin C that's derived from, um, I think it's Sago. I think it's a Sago vitamin C you can try. 
Uh, the other thing to try is mixing it with, oh, no, you've got the neutral form. You've got sodium ascorbate, so that shouldn't be an issue. So, yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, if one is severely iodine deficient, can starting iodine milligram dose, uh, it can. That's why we always have to start low and build up slow. Um, never start off with the full dose of iodine, start off with a little dose and build it up slowly. Because if you're very iodine deficient, yes, you can go um, overactive, that, but that is temporary. It's short lasting. The thyroid works out quickly. Oh, it's because there's plenty of iodine and, and, and things restore itself. So again, um, it's temporary. And yeah, that's why reason to start low and go slow. Okay, have we got to, yep, yeah, we've got to time. So let me close that and um, uh, let's kick off. So I'm going to share, screen share um, the PowerPoint. I hope you can all see that. Um, for some reason, it's in the wrong place for me, but um, 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 I hope you can all see that. If you can't, then um, give, tell me tell me in the chat box maybe or something. Well, okay. Well, I'm hoping you can see it. Let's um, put that. Okay. Um, let's put that. Okay, so I can't see you guys. I hope you can see me and I hope you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about the treatment of chronic infections and, and how we go about dealing with those. So let's hope this comes in. Next. Oh, there we go. So this is the overall strategy um, to treat chronic infections. And the key point to remember about this is this is not a battle, it's a war. And it's a war we have to wage for life because all pathologies have an infectious driver. Dementia, cancer, heart disease, they all have infections, chronic infections that are associated with them. So not only will this get you out of your ME, it will also allow you to live um, a long and, um, and healthy life um, um, because you won't be getting... Um, you won't be dying from heart disease, dementia or cancer. So the overall and, and of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a battle we know we're going to lose um, because when we when, when we get overwhelmed, we will die. But if I die when I'm 120, guess what? I will settle for that. So what we have to do is try and put things in place so we can live our life to our full potential at a good level and then drop off the perch very suddenly when that moment arises. So what that generally means is as we age, we have to toughen up on the regimes. You know, young people, children, teenagers can get away with blue murder because, you know, um, um, they have that force of life with them, if you like, and, and they have yet to acquire these infections. But as we go through life, we pick up these infections inevitably, and many of them drive disease. Much more about that in the our book, The Infection Game. So the overall principles is, first of all, um, um, supply the immune system with the raw materials that it needs and the energy to function. You know, the immune system is our standing army. And standing armies, you know, need a lot of energy. Um, uh, fighting armies need a lot of energy in order to, to get rid of invaders. And uh, the immune system is our standing army. And of course, um, chronic infection um, occurs when we have foreign invaders um, who are trying to invade our country and take it over. Allergy is a benign tourists. So, you know, we have tourists coming to the country, which is good for us. It makes us money. But allergy is when we start um, ear killing those. And uh, and that's 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 a damned nuisance. I'm allergic to dairy products. You know, um, um, there are other reasons why we shouldn't eat dairy products. But many of very often people uh, can't eat certain foods because they're allergic to them. And that's like I say, killing off benign tourists. And then autoimmunity, when the immune system is busy, that's civil war. That's um, body fighting self. So, but back to infections. Um, so the first thing we do is we starve out infections with a ketogenic diet. All infections love sugar. We'll come on to that in a moment. And then intermittent fasting is a very good way to switch on autophagy or self-eating. That further helps out control infections. Um, there's a uh, there's a old wives' tale that goes something like you know uh, uh, feed a cold and starve a fever or something like that. Maybe it's the other way around. But no, no, no. That's uh, what we should be. We should starve a cold and starve a fever. All wild animals, when they get sick, 
stop eating. They hibernate, they hi- tuck themselves up, um, um, they stop eating. And so all the energy in the body goes to um, uh, fighting that infection and not feeding it. They rapidly get into ketosis. As I say infections can only flourish on sugar. There's nothing worse than, you know, again, if you're going to hospital and you see people and they're ill and there's vast bowls of fruit and 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 and, and grapes and, and oranges and goodness knows what, and that's the worst thing you can do. It All those sugars feed those infections. And then we kill them with remedies such as vitamin C, iodine, DMSA, herbals, uh, and we will talk about that. Um, um, and then we reduce the infectious load um, with other substances like methylene blue and activate that with light. And then we use um, um, immunotherapy, such as microimmunotherapy, to concentrate our immune fire on the microbes, uh, and then finally we reduce inflammation. So that's the overall strategy um, that we are um, um, tackling. And the first thing we have to do is address energy delivery mechanisms. Now, I'm not going to talk about this at length. All you guys who have listened to me have heard me talk about this at length, but they are the five key Um, issues we have to address with respect to energy delivery mechanisms. Um, uh, And as I said, I'm using the car analogy there. And we all know that having the right fuel, oxygen, mitochondrial engine, di-da, di-da, di-da are absolutely vital. And if any one of those things is not working, then you're going to have poor energy delivery to your immune system. And therefore, it's not going to be able to fight an infection adequately. And um, again, I'm not going to talk about that, but that's the diet that we have to do um, in order to um, uh, make sure that we're running on ketones. And ketones come from fiber and they come from fat. Yes, some carbohydrates, you know, are essential to the body, but the emphasis is on some. Most people eat far too many carbohydrates. And if you eat far too many carbohydrates, then you end up with enough fermenting gut that we will talk about. So all infections love sugar. A quick case history here. Um, some of you may have heard before, but there's one lass who came to see me in in, in the August, and she had um, boils and carbuncles in her axilla. And she'd had them there for about three years. She'd had any number of antibiotics by mouth and intravenously. She'd had surgery on her axilla, tried to cut out the infection, but that had failed completely. And by the time she came to me, she had this huge, stinking, discharging mass there. Um, uh, and the, really, the conventional doctors had nothing to offer her. Now, nobody had taken a dietary history. She thought it was healthy to eat fruit. Uh, and that would help fight the infection. And she was a fruitaholic. She lived on orange juice, apple juice, pineapple juice, um, bananas, pears, apples, you name it. She was stuffing them back. And of course, those the fruit sugar in there was feeding the, the microbes uh, directly. Uh, we know o- often that diabetics often uh, present with recurrent infections. Now, she wasn't diabetic. She was just eating a lot of sugar. So very simply, we stopped, put onto a a ketogenic diet, so cut out all that fruit, so her blood sugar came down immediately. Uh, Vitamin C to bowel tolerance, so she was ending up about five or six grams of vitamin C daily, and then painted the area with iodine, neat Lugol's iodine on a daily basis. By the Christmas, it had completely healed up. The infection had gone. Um, And if we hadn't put in those infections, goodness knows where she'd be now because that was slowly invading her armpit. So it just illustrates the point that sugars feed infections and the keto diet is absolutely the starting point. A useful, a very useful tool is continuous glucose monitoring. And um, we can now get this. And um, um, uh, of course, I don't ask my patients to try anything without me trying it first. It's very easy to use and it tells you what your blood sugar is um, from hour to hour, well, from minute to minute, second to second throughout the day. And um, anybody who is diabetic, you know, absolutely must have uh, get one of these. Now, the, the test kit only lasts for two weeks. So you find a window of time um, uh, to, to use it. And during that time, you can experiment with different foods, see what puts your blood sugar up, see what brings it down, see how exercise brings it down. If you can't exercise, well, then you have to even strict with the keto diet. Um, and the idea is to get your blood sugars um, nice and 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 level. Uh, another very useful test is to measure ketones with the ketone breath meter. There are many on the market. Uh, this is the one I tend to use these days. It's called ACE Track. 
The problem with it, it's rather expensive. It's um, 200 quid's worth of gear. Um, um, but I learned about that from Dr. Rachel uh, Brown, who is a um, consultant psychiatrist in Edinburgh. And she works with Ali Houston. And they run a, a very good website called Metabolic Psychiatry, MetSci. And they use those, they recommend those meters routinely. If when you decide to purchase one, you put in M-E-T-P-S-Y, that is a code that will get you a reduction on that. So you then get about 170 quid. So that's a bonus. But um, the diet is absolutely the starting point. The next thing we have to do is sort out the upper fermenting gut because 90% of infections get into our body from the gut. And um, um, you might think, well, you know, if the infection's already in there, you know, what are we going to do about that? But new infections come in. And, you know, I see so many people who have been diagnosed with the Lyme disease or the Epstein-Barr virus or the chronic fungal infection, and they've had the, the mega drugs to treat that, and they are no better. And part of the reason for that is that if you've got one infection in there, then you will have others for the very same reason that you've got that major infection in there, because the immune system isn't working properly and others get in and they are called co-infections. And I'm sure many of you have heard um, um, Armin Schwarzbach speak about this. He runs a fantastic lab in Germany, um, Armin Laboratories, and um, he has a screening panel he does and um, is looking for Lyme disease, next time bar virus, and all the herpes viruses and coxsackies and de da de da de da. And most people have a cocktail of certainly one, two, maybe three, or even four infections. But these, I say, 90% come in the gut. So we don't want to add to any infections that you may already have. And um, uh, this is why it's so important to sort out the upper fermenting gut. And the principles of treatment are very simple. First of all, stop feeding them. You know, all these microbes love sugars and carbs, so it's their PK diet. And then we kill them with vitamin C to bowel tolerance and iodine. And the reason I like those two tools is because they are inexpensive, extremely safe, and they do lots of other good jobs as well. Detox, antioxidant status, get rid of heavy metals, um, um, de da, de da, de da. So, um, uh, and they're cheap. And there are the doses. I mean, when I first started trying vitamin C, I got up to 35 grams a day before I had any bowel trouble um, or bowel disturbance. Uh, and that tells me I must have had enough fermenting gut and I wasn't controlling it well with my diet alone. Now I take about four or five grams a day. Um, and, um, and then I also take iodine. And the joy of iodine and vitamin C is they both contact kill all microbes. Now, they do it in a different way. One is a reducing agent. The other is an oxidizing agent. So the key is don't take them at the same time. Take them separately. And um, um, you can take uh, vitamin C in the day, Lugol's iodine last thing at night. These days, I, I'm always experimenting. These days, I'm trying Lugol's iodine in the morning and vitamin C with, combined with methylene blue, which you'll read. We'll hear about in a moment later on in the day. But um you know, I had these regimes and um, uh, and they are just the starting point. And then you experiment with yourself. You know, you're going to be the number one guinea pig and you see how that manifests on you. And um, as an aside, so much other pathology is driven by allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut. If you've got the microbes here, they get into the bloodstream, they get stuck at distal sites and they drive all these conditions. So if you've got any of these problems, then um, sorting out the upper fermenting gut is always going to be absolutely the starting point. OK, and once we've got the upper fermenting gut sorted out, then you can start giving the immune system the raw materials it needs to fight, particularly zinc, particularly selenium. These are all you know, essential minerals. Vitamin D is the most important anti-inflammatory in the body. Um, uh, omega fatty acids, you know, absolutely vital. Um, so many of these can come in as part of your uh, paleoketogenic diet. Um, um, but just take the basic package of, of supplements. And these days, I don't, I rarely do nutritional tests on people because I know what the answer is going to be. Everybody's low, with, without supplements, everybody's going to be deficient in zinc, um, in uh, um, essential fatty acids, in magnesium, in selenium, uh, in chromium, in vitamin C, in iodine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So don't spend lots of money on tests because that's not going to change management. All these things are safe um, uh, to take. Okay, and then um, of course, ME um, is not the same as chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome is poor energy delivery mechanisms. 
ME is energy delivery mechanisms and inflammation. And those um, are the, the sort of things we can do to address inflammation. But we nearly always end up with infection. And um, as I say, the way to avoid infections is, first of all, um, um, do the keto diet, vitamin C and iodine. But at the first hint of any infection, hit it very hard with vitamin C and hit it very hard with iodine because the, both of those contact kill all and massively reduce the loading dose. And that stacks the odds in favor of the immune system. So vitamin C um, with any first hint of a sniffle, you know, um, a sneeze, a sore throat, take 10 grams every hour until you get diarrhea. And we have to do it that way because there is an urgency about this. You don't want to spend three or four days getting up to your bowel torrents dose because that's three or four days when the microbe is invading your body and getting ahead of the game. So uh, I, at the first hint of a bit of a sneeze, a bit of a cough, a soreness, whatever, 10 grams, 10 grams, 10 grams until I empty the, my gut. And um, that has two advantages. First of all, you've got big doses of vitamin C in the gut where the microbes are to contact kill them. And secondly, you physically sweep them out of the bowel um, um, uh, as you start to get the trots. So, um, and that has kept the infection free for about 35 years. And the other very useful intervention is sniffing iodine. I'm sure you're all aware of this, but again, it's a dead simple uh, intervention. Salt pipe, which is just a plastic tube for sea salt and iodine, Lugol's iodine. Um, and you put two drops of iodine in the mouth of the salt pipe like that. One, two, give it a little shake and snip it. Don't inhale it through the mouth because it'll make you cough, but over the nose and snip it. Now I can, I can clearly smell that. I love the smell of it. And um, if you can smell it, you have got a therapeutic dose. And that contact kills all microbes in the airways, the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, the back of the throat, the bronchi and the lungs. I now have five patients um, who have bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is chronic lung infection. And normally their life is spent going from one infection, an antibiotic, and then they're a bit better, and then another infection, another antibiotic, and on they go. They end up with multiple antibiotics. They end up with an MRSA, and then they're in real trouble. But since using the salt pipe with iodine, together with all the stuff we've talked about, their need for antibiotics is reduced to zero. So it's a fabulously uh, effective treatment. Okay, we've talked about that. There we go. I'm always jumping ahead of myself. Sorry about that, guys. Um, a Paul Marek, again, I'm sure you're aware of his um, use of vitamin C to treat um, uh, septicemia. Paul Marek makes the point that anybody who dies from an infection will die with scurvy. So we, vitamin C is effectively the bullets with which we shoot infections. And you know, if your if your immune system is 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 you know shooting um, viruses and bacteria and yeast, you want to give it lots of ammunition. He uh, ran an intensive care unit specialising people with, with with sepsis and advanced shock, and with all the usual interventions, oxygen, um, antibiotics, you know, intensive care, ITU, the mortality was about forty percent. When he added vitamin C in his regimes, the mortality dropped to below one percent. So it just illustrates the importance of vitamin C in any infection, acute and chronic. Okay, uh, there we go. I've jumped ahead of myself again. So this is for respiratory infections. Um, uh, it's great. And the point is sniff it because if you've got infections in the nose, you've got them in the sinus, you've got them in the pharynx, you've got them all the way throughout the respiratory tract. If you put it through your mouth and breathe through the mouth, A, it makes you cough, and B, you miss out the sinuses and the nasal cavities. So sniffing it, um, works brilliantly well. Okay, but most people come to me because they've got the chronic infection. Now, this is taken out. Craig and I have just rewritten the chronic fatigue syndrome book. Um, um, it's due out in January. I wish I could send you all a free copy, but my publisher would kill me if I did that. Um, 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 uh, and we have uh, written the book. So it is um, it's written on the basis of the need to know. So this is the absolute bare minimum to do for chronic fatigue syndrome, ME and long COVID. So it's actually will be a shorter and a smaller book than those that have gone before when I try to put in everything. Um, but it's much more concise. It's very understandable. It's very readable. And so these 
um, sections are taken from the chapters about treating chronic infection. Um, um, uh, and you're welcome to have these slides, um, uh, but we'd love you to buy the book when it comes out. So um, this is the overall principle for treating uh, chronic infection. First of all, improve the Im immune system. And we just talked about that. So all elements of energy delivery mechanisms. And secondly, as I said, by the time people have got ME, the whole thing has become systemic. And um, they won't have just one infection. They will have a whole heap of infections because the immune system is, is just failing to keep them at bay. And so my view is we be, should be putting in place interventions to reduce the total numbers of microbes. Now, we need tools that everybody can access. Um, and um, the first tool is, um, well, these are the tools we use. These are the three-pronged approach. First of all, dimethyl sulfoxide, which dissolves bi biofilm and does much more, as we will see. Secondly, methylene blue, which has broad spectrum activity, gets a whole range of um, um, microbes and is also very good for mitochondrial function, as you shall see. And then photodynamic therapy, which activates the methylene blue and makes it work so much, so much more effectively. And the point is, anybody can do this. Uh, the potential for harm is virtually zero. And um, uh, and I've had some notable successes already with 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 patients with whom I was really struggling. So we start off with DMSO. Now, I'm not going to read all this out because you will die of boredom. But um, I want to skip through the properties of DMSO, what it means and, and how we can use it. But it's a fabulous multitasking tool. And I think that the major mechanism by which DMSO is affected is that it improves fourth phase water. Now, um, um, if anybody wants to talk about that, I will. But fourth phase water, essentially, inst water, instead of being a liquid, it is a gel. It's what gives everything structure. It gives membrane structure, mitochondria structure, um, cells structure. It's what stops cells sticking to each other when they're circulating in the bloodstream. Uh, and it allows membranes to become well charged. And that is important for energy delivery mechanisms. So um, and, and that uh, that factor, um, improving full phase water, explains its known action as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and therefore, it's going to be good for any autoimmune condition. It's an excellent anticoagulant. In fact, intravenous DMSO has been used to treat to dissolve blood clots and so reverse strokes and heart attacks. Now, of course, in the acute situation, you can't give anybody DMSO, but you can pour it on their skin. And uh, if I had somebody who was having a, 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 an acute clotting event, pouring DMSO, you know, maybe on the anticubital phosphate so it gets right into the bloodstream, and you, you get the levels in the blood come up very quickly, uh, that'd be a fantastic treatment. And for the same reason, it has analgesic effects. It's a very closely, uh, rel it's a close relative of all the sulfur containing compounds that we know are important. And many people take supplements of glucosamine, MSM, chondroitin, alpha lipoic acid, di da, di da, di da. Um, um, uh, uh, and DMSO is, is a central part of, 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 of those compounds. So it helps us to detoxify. It's essential for methylation. In low dose, it's antioxidants, so it protects mitochondria, protects, prevents cancer, protects against radiation. In high doses, it's antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. So again, it's got broad antimicrobial properties. It's a universal solvent. And um, because it's antioxidant, it can be used for any condition associated with inflammation or pain. And these are the sort of clinical pictures for which it's used. So for example, interstitial cystitis, which, of course, is allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut, causing an irritable bladder, pelvic pain, maybe vul you know, vulvodyna, and in women and men, maybe prostatitis. Um, it has an FDA license to treat interstitial cystitis. So even, even the conventional doctors like to use it. It's a pain reliever, so it's good for any painful muscle or skin. And so it's good for all these conditions, arthritis, fibromyalgia, headaches, tick dolera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, implying it topically to the skin is a proven efficacy for healing and repair. As I say, improves blood supply because because it's improving fourth phase water. It improves blood supply, and many microbes when they're causing infection, they hide themselves away in parts of the body, and then they create biofilm around them in order to keep the blood system at bay. Because if they keep the blood system at bay, they're they're keeping oxygen out, and they like being in oxygen free um, environment. They they thrive in anaerobic environments, and of course uh, they, the immune system can't get at them if there's no blood supply. Um, and again, improves mitochondrial function, um, which of course is, is absolutely essential. So again, any condition associated with poor energy delivery mechanism, DMSO is going to be helpful. 
it um, um, uh, dissolves, it allows cholesterol to be carried around in the blood as, as a cholesterol sulfate. Um, yeah, improvement, I've said that. Um, good source of sulfur, dissolves biofilm, dissolves viral lipid coats. So it, it, and any of the viruses that have a lipid surrounding, it will dissolve that. So it's going to be good for those um, treatments as well. And you can either use it topically or you can take it systemically. Um, here are more um, actions of DMSO. So it really is uh, a fantastically useful tool. And the way to use it is, well, you first of all, you, have, you want to have a nice pure source. So either get it in glass bottles or resistant plastic. It goes solid at 18 degrees centigrade. So you need to keep it in a, a, above that temperature. And you can consume DNSA just by slugging it back. But um, 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 in... Um, um, it just gives it slightly exothermic. So if you do just drink it neat, it gives a slight warm sensation in the mouth. So it's not harmful that, but it's, it's just a peculiar sensation. Some people prefer to um, dilute it in a glass of water, and I would suggest 10 or 20 mils a day. It goes straight through skin, but it, as it passes through skin, it will carry with it anything that's on the skin. So any cosmetics on the skin, any chemicals, tattoos, um, metal piercings will flush those toxins into the skin. So it wants to be um, a nice, clean skin. The main problem with, with DMSO is it does pong. Now, I can't smell it. Um, so I don't know if I'm taking it and I don't know if anybody else is taking it, but some people find it very offensive. And that includes my daughter. So, of course, I was slugging it back to see what effect it was having. And when I went out to see her on Paris, she said, I jumped off Eurostar and she said, I said, hi, Claire. And she said, hi, mom. And then she kind of leapt back about six foot and said, mom, you pong, you smell like you know, a rotten vegetable shop. So um, you'll have to have a negotiation with other members of the household before you dare, dare use that or try. But just bear that in mind. For some people, that makes it um, a problem. OK, so when we've got DMSO, then the next thing to add in is methylene blue. And um, methylene blue has a very broad spectrum of action. The French National Library has got a huge heap. Thank you, Craig, for finding that for me, by the way. A huge heap of references um, detailing the efficacy of methylene blue. And it has broad spectrum action against the whole range of infections. And what's so interesting, its effects are activated by um, uh, uh, red light, near infrared light and far infrared light. And we call that photodynamic therapy. So um, this is how methylene blue works. This is the action. This is the disease process that we can use it for. And these are the references um, with the relevant um, um, extracts you know, highlighted there. So um, I'm not going to read this all out because you will die of boredom. How are we doing for time? Oh, not too bad. I'm not doing too badly. That, that's, that makes a change. Um, um, because it's a very important donor and acceptor of electrons in mitochondria. So it's almost like adding in, you know, extra coenzyme Q10. And um, it reduces the friction in mitochondria. It reduces the um, pro-oxidant effects of generating energy. And so mitochondria work more efficiently. The, um, um, uh, the electrons flow through mitochondria and the protons are pumped far more efficiently in the presence of DMSO and methylene blue. And very often people well, people do report improvements in their energy for taking it. So it's going to, so any condition associated with poor energy delivery is going to be helpful. Obviously, chronic fatigue syndrome, heart disease, dementia, maybe even cancer, um, obviously potential for use in these conditions. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and the point here is, is many chronic infections are susceptible. In fact, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was won by Paul Ehrlich, who demonstrated um, um, its effect efficacy to treat malaria. Some of you are probably aware of um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine used to treat malaria and COVID, and that is derived, it's a very close relative of methylene blue. Okay, um, uh, in combination with light, it's, it inactivates all these um, microbes, which you can read uh, as well as I can, hepatitis C, HIV, respiratory viruses, um, it's also effective against most of the herpes virus. And we know the Epstein-Barr virus, a really nasty little one. Many people are carrying uh, cytomegalovirus. It's a proven efficacy against COVID-19, as a hydroxychloroquine uh, is derived from that. Um, um, oh, I put COVID there. Okay, I've doubled up there. Um, it's it's antifungal. Um, oh, I meant to put that. It's, it has, um, is that Lyme disease? Yeah, COVID-19. It's antifungal. Um, it binds 
it's used for carbon monoxide poisoning. It's also monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and so and some people find their mood is improved when they take that. Okay, so so the point there is it has broad spectrum activity. Now, um, again, with any new intervention, and it doesn't matter if that's intervention is iodine or vitamin C or PK diet, start low and go slow. Because if you start with a big dose suddenly, you can get awful die-off reactions or, or Herxheimer reactions. So always start with low doses and build up slowly. Um, it's incredibly safe, so much so that it can be injected directly into a vein uh, in doses of 15 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So I usually work up to two milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, regardless of, of your body weight, they start with low and build up slow. But the point is, this makes it gloriously safe stuff. Now, always get the pharmaceutical grade, um, and you will know it's, it's pharmaceutical grade because it will have BP73 on it. Um, uh, and and uh, um, unfortunately, and some of you are probably aware, we were missold um, uh, methylene blue. We were told it's pharmaceutical grade, and thanks to a very vigilant member of the Facebook group, um, we then discovered that, that we'd been told porky pies, and it was not uh, pharmaceutical grade. We have got some on en route. Um, it comes in a 10 gram pot, so it's very cheap. And the way we do it is um, put a whole 10 gram pot in one liter of water. And that gives you a 1% solution, which is 10 milligrams per ml. And at two milligrams per kilogram, that would last you 80 days. So that's cheap medicine. Um, I, tell you, I have to say, when you as you mix it up, methylene blue gets everywhere. Um, and I managed to dye everything, you know, uh, my hands, the bottle, the kitchen serves. I managed to dye everything blue. If you do do that, then just rub neat ascorbic acid acid onto your hands, uh, vitamin C, and that gets rid of the color straight away. And the and um, again, you can just drink it like that. But if you drink it like that, you stain your teeth and your mouth and your tongue bright blue and your lips. You know, it's enough to frighten the horses and the children. So um, uh, a very useful trick here is to put some ascorbic acid in there, a couple of grams of ascorbic acid, stir it in and leave it for maybe an hour or two. And that converts the methylene blue into leucomethylene blue, which is colorless. And then you can drink it without staining everything um, uh, blue. Now, in the body, it swings between leucomethylene blue and methylene blue as it accepts and donates electrons, a little bit like vitamin C does. So with vitamin C, it doesn't, it doesn't change its action in any way. And you will pee blue. You will produce blue urine. So don't panic when it comes out um, um, at the other, the other end. Again, start with a tiny dose and build up, build up slowly. Now, methylene blue is well absorbed in the upper gut. So that means, and it's excreting urine. So you don't, you don't have a blue turds, you have blue urine. So it doesn't upset the microbiome, which is important. And it will also help sterilize the upper gut if you've got problems in that department. The only thing to bear in mind is it is a mild monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and potentially it could cause reactions with foods. Now, of course, you know me being guinea pig number one, I have tried all these foods whilst taking uh, methylene blue at, at, at two milligrams per kilogram. Now, I haven't tested cheeses, but I've certainly eaten sauerkraut, cured meats, um, um, uh, alcohol, uh, broad beans, coffee. And so far, I've had, I personally have had no interactions whatsoever. And I think that in, illustrates the point that it is a very mild monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So we have to put that there for, um, for obvious reasons, but don't um, lose too much sleep over that. Don't think, oh, you're going to um, you know, cause serious problems if you um, uh, combine the two. There are some medications that you should avoid, and they are detailed there. So please just have a, a look at that, and, um, and there's a, a, a link there if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Okay, and so those are the two things. And the third thing is we activate it with light and heat. We know heat kills many infections, and just being cold will make you susceptible to infection. There's another reason why it's important to get energy delivery mechanisms right. And if you're not sure how hot you are, or what your temperature is. Um, oh gosh, and I seem to have lost everything. Um, uh, oh, there we go. Um, get yourself one of these um, thermometers, which is very quick and easy to use. So you just hold it at your forehead, press the button, and seconds later, um, you get a reading. So there we go, 36.8, so I'm nice and warm. And because um, uh, being cold will allow infections to, to come in. And if your, body is, if your body temperature is constantly running cold, then that will make you susceptible. 
But um, uh, photodynamic therapy does all this stuff. It improves mitochondrial function, it improves antioxidant status, it penetrates into the tissues, and there are lots and lots of studies showing how light is efficacious, and we have summarized them um, in, um, in the book. Oops, Daisy, I haven't got the I haven't got the, the, those details in there, but um, I believe you me, there's lots of um, ways we can do it. Now, I've looked around for the various devices, and um, I have settled on this one to try. It's very cheap; it costs less than hundred pounds, and you wear it like a cummerbund round your waist. So, if you're cold, it keeps you nice and warm, and it constantly supplies red light and near infrared light, um, uh, which then activates the methylene blue and the DMSO as it circulates around the body um, in your torso. So, um, it's again the joy of this is it's very easy to do. You don't have to sort of you know take half an hour of your day to sit in a sauna. You just stick it on in the morning, and and if it's comfortable, I'd be inclined to leave it all the time. Okay, now there's another um, intervention I learned about um, fairly recently, and this is not in the book because I've only learned about it recently and I've yet to put it to the test. And um, this was, uh, I learned about this from a wonderful German doctor called Dr. Joachim Gerlach. And he asked the question, you know, why don't we use herbals? Now, if you look at life from the point of view of a plant, it doesn't want to be eaten. It doesn't want to be attacked by bacteria. It doesn't want to be attacked by viruses or by um, uh, fungi. And all plants have natural antimicrobials with them to keep these, uh, to allow them to survive in the natural world. If they didn't have these natural antimicrobials, then the bugs would just move in and, uh, and gobble them up. So all herbs, all vegetables, Everything that's live out there in the natural world has natural antimicrobial activities. And what um, Dr. Gerlach did is he went to the nine top herbs, which have got the best reputation and the best track record for killing infections. I'm not going to read them out to you, but as you can see, many of those names are familiar. EGCG is what's in green tea, for example. Bicalin, that's Chinese skull cup. Quercetin, you probably all know about. di da di da da Curcumin, of course, that's a very popular um, antimicrobial remedy. So he, he put these all into one preparation, which he called medicinal nine, because guess what? It's got nine herbs. This has been developed in India, and I'm sure that you're all aware, 60% um, uh, of nutraceuticals are produced in India. They have a fantastic track record. And um, it has proven activity in all those ways. If you want the PowerPoint on that, I can send that to you with pleasure. But multiple actions on um, um, a whole range of microbes, secondary infections. It's also markedly anti-inflammatory, so it protects against hypercoagulability and hyperinflation and is organ protective. It protects against um, damage to organs from infections. It's extremely safe. It's been trialed. Um, there've been no uh, serious side effects from it. Um, and this is how we can get it. Um, that's about the cost. Um, actually, it's it's not it's more like seven pounds a day rather than five pounds a day. Um, I should have changed that. And the dose is fifty mil a day for a sixty kilogram per person. More for um, somebody who's heavier. Now, the way I'm using uh, uh, in my patients at the moment is I'm saying just have one pot initially just to make sure that you tolerate it. And one or two people just haven't been able to tolerate it. It upsets their gut or maybe they're allergic to it. Um, and of course, start with the low dose, build up slowly. It's the old story, the sicker you are, the slower you go. And a typical course is about 42 days. And it has been tested in a whole range of conditions, including long COVID um, with good effects. And then finally, another very useful intervention is microimmunotherapy. And um, this is a technique I've been getting interested in. I don't use it a lot because it's expensive. And all my patients are PBs. They're poor bastards, as I explained. They can't, they can't afford it. If I had a patient who's a rich bastard, an RB, then yeah, I'd, I'd use this as well. But most of my patients are PBs and they can't afford microimmunotherapy. It works out at anything between 75, 150 pounds a month for one remedy. So it is expensive, but it is of proven benefit. And we can use microimmunotherapy in two ways. We can use it to um, um, manipulate the protein synthesizing mechanism within cells so that the viruses make poor quality virus. The explanation I like is that, you know, um, if you think of a virus as a scorpion, 
then you if you um, apply microimmunotherapy, you make a school scorpion with not a sting in the tail, but with a fluffy tail, i.e. it doesn't work. So it changes at how viruses are synthesized within cells, and that reduces the infectious load. And you can also use microimmunotherapy to um, focus the immune system's fire on what it should be doing. Because if you had all this chronic inflammation going on for, you know, um, weeks, months, or years, sometimes the immune system loses its focus. And on top of that, um, we have to ask if the immune system is depressed or is overactive. And it helps to normalize that. So um, um, if the immune system is underactive, then we need remedies that stimulate. And if the immune system is overactive, then uh, we need systems, um, uh, remedies that calm things down. The majority of people are underactive, um, um, so roughly 80% are. Okay, and then finally, as we age and as we acquire disease, then um, um, our endogenous um, opiate system goes down and our endogenous cannabinoid system goes down. You know, the, the body and the brain makes its own opiates. They're called endorphins. It makes its own uh, cannabis-like drug uh, uh, substances, and that's called endocannabinoids. And these are essential for modulating inflammation in the body. Every single cell in the body and mitochondria has receptors for endorphins and for cannabinoids. And um, um, and the way to increase the levels of endogenous um, 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 morphine-like substance, endorphins, is with low-dose naltrexone. And this is how you can do this very easily and cheaply yourself. You can get naltrexone online from All Day Chemist, and it comes in 50 milligram tablets. So you put 50 milligram tablets in 50 mils of water, and even my maths can work out that gives you one milligram per mil. And um, start with one mil at night and gradually build up to 4.5 mil. Now, the idea here is naltrexone blocks the brain's own production of endorphins and the body responds by producing more. So it's an indirect way of stimulating endorphins. And there's a huge um, um, amount of research being done with low-dose naltrexone and essentially you name almost any um, inflammatory condition and low-dose naltrexone is likely to be helpful. If you go to my um, website, low-dose naltrexone, there's a, a link there to the, um, I think it's the Naltrexone Research Trust or something like that, where you can see the, the, the plethora of studies that shows that it works. Mm -hmm. And the second um, thing too is, um, in, is to help your endogenous cannabinoid system. And we can do that with CBD oil which we can get in this country, THC-free. And we're not trying to give um, big doses of, of, of cannabis to make you stoned. In fact, you can't get stoned on CBD oil because it hasn't got THC in it. But we're trying to restore normality. We are trying to um, replace the cannabinoid system, which has been exhausted by age and has been exhausted by chronic infection. And particular indications would be for people who have sleep disturbances, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, and that's all part of a chronic infection. And both are extremely safe treatments. Nobody has ever died from a cannabis overdose because once the receptors are saturated, they're saturated. And again, with cannabis, oil, CBD oil, start with low dose, build up slowly. It's easy to overshoot and miss what I call that sweet spot. Okay, so that is the overall um, 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 strategy to do it, improve energy delivery mechanisms, um, reduce, um, uh, reduce inflammation, um, and, and reduce the infectious and inflammatory load. And all these things helps to nudge you in the right direction. Okay, so I think that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, time for questions. So I'll stop sharing now so I can see you all. And um, um, okay, so I don't think... Oh, crumbs, we've got chat box working, is working now, that's a relief. Um, so let me go through um, the chat box first, and then I'll go through the questions. Now, we've got uh, a lot of questions, so um, I will, um, if, if the questions have been addressed in, in, the, in the talk, then I won't answer them. Um, if the question hasn't been addressed, then of course I will, otherwise um, that will be the most efficient use of time, I think. Okay, right. Um, 
Yep, you can have the PowerPoint afterwards, uh, no problem at all. And also this is recorded and um, Martin and Claire have the techie skills to put this up online. So don't panic if you've missed something. Um, okay. Uh, okay, not sure how to measure up 50% DMSO. Oh, well, that's very easy. 50% DMSO is half DMSO, half water. 50 mils of DMSO, 50 mils of water gives you a 50% solution. Um, okay, if the underactive thyroid, okay. Um, um, do I still need to take adrenal supplements if the adrenal stress test is, short, is normal? Well, probably not, no. If the adrenal stress test is normal, then the adrenals are working fine. So you don't need to take adrenal um, support as well as thyroid support. Okay, the code was, oh, well done, you put it in METSI. Thank you for that. Um, I had reaction to ascorbic acid because I have many mast cells issues. Okay. Um, um, no, don't take um, don't take iodine and vitamin C at the same time. Uh, ascorbic acid, some people react to it because it's an acid and they just don't tolerate that. And in that event, mix it with magnesium carbonate. And the recipe is two parts of ascorbic acid to one part magnesium by weight. And that gives you a neutral solution. And some people find they tolerate that very much better than ascorbic acid. Um, if you take a lot of ascorbic acid, it makes you feel very bloated. Well, um, that's probably because you're, um, you've got a sub about, you, you, you've got, you haven't got enough to cause diarrhea, but you haven't got enough to cause bloating. Because if you take too much vitamin C, some of it will get into the large bowel. You know, vitamin C should be absorbed in the upper gut and then we excrete in urine. But if too much vitamin C um, is taken, some of it gets into the large bowel and starts to kill off some of the friendly microbes in the large bowel, which then get uh, fermented by other microbes and that causes the bloating. Now, when you get the dose of vitamin C right, you should have no gut symptoms at all. Um, if you start to overdose, very often you get a bit of bloating and foul smelling wind is, is, is common. But when you get the dose right, you should have no symptoms. Okay, I've had a dental abscess and I had to take antibiotics. Okay. Um, 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 yeah, dental abscesses are, are common um, for, in people who are eating keto, uh, 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 are eating Western diets because it's sugar and carbohydrate driven. You know, I've had dental abscesses in the distant past when I didn't know any better and I was still, I was, I was low allergen diet, but I wasn't low carbohydrate. Since then, I've never had any dental abscesses. Dental decay is caused by sugars and carbohydrates, not just in the sugars that you eat, but if you're running a high blood sugar, if you're spiking blood sugar, it spills over into the saliva and then you get dental decay from that. So um, since starting as I found proper meat, um, make me feel queasy, nauseous. Now I eat dairy, yogurt, porridge, although I shouldn't because I can't tolerate it. Okay. Nausea is always a difficult symptom. There's no easy to answer to that. Um, and you may find that you're helped by intermittent um, 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 fasting, i.e. try to eat all your food within a six hour window of time. Most people find nausea is worse in the morning. But if you eat your food within a six hour window of time, that means the stomach is empty or pretty much empty for 18 hours a day. And that gives a chance for the stomach to clean itself up. Um, and it cleans itself out by producing stomach acid and stomach acid you know, kills any microbes that may be there. So um, uh, eat your food within a window of time. That may be very helpful. And some people get nausea if they have something that's hypertonic. Um, so um, we all know that if you drank a pint of water with a teaspoon of salt in it, you would vomit. In fact, that's how you make people vomit in casualty when they've eaten, eaten or drunk something they shouldn't. So a hypertonic solution, a concentrated solution can make you nauseous. So again, when you're having your vitamin C, um, make sure you have it, uh, don't have it too strong, have it fairly dilute, um, uh, and maybe that will be helpful. Um, but nausea is always difficult. Okay, um, is it okay to take iodine on levothyroxine? Yes, totally desirable. It's not just the thyroid that needs um, iodine. Many other departments of the body need iodine. So, for example, fibrocystic disease of the breast, you can cure that. We can get rid of that with iodine. The muscles need iodine. The heart needs iodine. Some tachydysrhythmias won't settle until you've corrected iodine. In fact, there is a drug used to treat tachydysrhythmias um, called amiodarone. 
because it's full of iodine. And it's the iodine bit that, that has the antidysrhythmic effect. Of course, it's very toxic to the thyroid gland because it's a toxic form of, thyro of um, iodine. So uh, eventually it does knock out the thyroid gland. So I don't recommend you uh, take uh, amiodarone for any great length of time. It just illustrates the point that iodine is essential for the heart. It's essential for the brain. The commonest cause of mental deficiency throughout the world is iodine deficiency. It's essential for the immune system. It's essential for the um, to make oxytocin, which is the love hormone. And as you all know, it was, it was oxytocin that Puck put on Titania's eyes so that when she woke up, she fell in love with Bottom. When we've got oxytocin on board, um, we fall in love with things. That's why I fall in love with my scruffy little terrier who's sitting next to me saying, come on, mom, it's time to go for a walk. Um, um, oxytocin is the love hormone and iodine is essential for that. Okay. How do you know when you need a new salt pipe? You don't need a new salt pipe. That will last you forever. Uh, you can hear the salt in it. It's just the delivery mechanism to get um, the iodine to you. Oh, gosh, I'm a bit addicted to it. I, I do love the smell of iodine. It smells wonderful. Okay. Um, I'm currently out of hospital with PID, okay, pelvic inflammatory disease and infections. Well, if you've got pelvic inflammatory disease um, of unknown cause, well, um, you should take the antibiotics. Um, you probably don't want to hear that from me, but um, if you don't take the antibiotics, then you risk the, the inflammatory, the pelvic infection uh, running on and getting a scar tissue with a risk of subsequent infertility. So if you've got pelvic inflammatory disease, you take the antibiotics. Now, the likeliest cause is chlamydia. Um, because um, it's 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 a nasty little microbe and it's a, a number one cause of, of a PID. So you're probably being prescribed doxycycline, is my guess. So you know you take that. Now it does uh, it does have the potential to damage the microbiome, and so we look after the microbiome by feeding it the right um, um, foods. Now we don't know much about the microbiome, but what we do know is that the more diverse it is, the healthier you are. And you achieve diversity of the microbiome by eating as diverse a diet as you possibly can. Now, some of you have probably heard Tim Spectra on the Zoe Project, and he's got lots of good ideas there. I often listen to him in the evenings. And one of the points he makes is aim to eat at least 30 different foods a week. The more diverse your diet is, I say, the more diverse your microbiome is. And it doesn't have to be a lot of. So a salad with, you know, a few sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. Um, what else do I put in mine? Uh, uh, maybe a, a few pulses, uh, chickpeas, um, obviously lettuce. Um, I've got um, um, uh, tomatoes. All that sort of stuff, um, uh, celery, gives you a nice diverse um, 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 diet. Hugh Fernie uh, Fernie Whittingstall des uh, describes a magnificent soup that he makes. That's got all oh, about I think counted twenty or twenty five different ingredients in there. And just keep piling them all in there and make a glorious bowl of, of of soup. And again, great for the diversity of the microbiome. Okay, um, salt pipe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Salt pipes used the first sign of any infection. Okay, you can get vitamin C. I think in chances, yeah, you're going, to, you're going to get the slides. Okay, DMS so really hard to stomach as it tastes foul. I'm not sure we can get around that. Um, it's a case of you know, pinching your nose, but you know, I'm quite sure. I mean, one of my daughters slugs it back uh, and I hardly know she's taking it. And the other one, you know, absolutely cannot stand me being anywhere near her if I've had a nifter of it. So it's very individual. Um, um, so you just got to pinch your nose and swallow it down. So not, not an easy solution there. Okay. Um, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, Sue Chippendale um, successfully stopped thyroid medication um, uh, by taking um, large drops of Lugol Zardine. Now, that's such an interesting observation, and you're not the only person that has said that. And we have to ask the question, why? What is that all about? And a possible explanation, I don't know if it's right, but it's biologically plausible, is that, you know, early on in evolution, our iodine was abundant. And of course, you know, we evolved um, um, in Africa. Uh, and almost certainly we had a, a window of time where we took to the ocean and uh, and we lived on, on, on the uh, in the sea. And that explains why we only have hair on the tops of our heads. That explains why we have subcutaneous uh, fat to keep us warm, like dolphins and whales do. Whereas my little dog, she doesn't have any subcutaneous fat. She has a nice thick um, furry coat. So we don't, we've lost our hair. Um, it's why we adopted the upright pose because we could be buoyant in water and we learned to 
and 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 other reasons. Um, if you want to um, read the book, it's Elaine Jones, I think, who's wrote a book called The Descent of Man. Anyway, but living like that, we had iodine in abundance. And I think that where we had an abundance of calories and quality foods, we had an abundance of iodine, and that allowed the body to spend energy. And so the body worked out there's lots of iodine around, we can let mitochondria run faster, and therefore we can have lots of energy to, to, to fight, to run, to predate, and so on and so forth. And then of course, as we moved away from the, um, the uh, coast, uh, that iodine was less abundant and the body evolved systems of packaging iodine in some proteins in order that the iodine could still have its effect as the accelerator pedal of our car. And we called that iodine packaged up in protein. We call that thyroid hormones. Now, I've had two or three people now who have been able to survive with much lower doses of thyroid and some by dint of taking high dose iodine. So, um, uh, so Sue, that's a fascinating experiment you've done. Um, um, I don't know if it will work for everybody. You know, iodine is gloriously safe stuff. In the in the 19th century, in the 20th century, when physicians were using it, they were using it in much higher doses than we use it now. Sometimes in gram doses, i.e., some thousands of milligrams a day. So it is it is wonderfully safe stuff, and that'd be a very safe thing to do. So, um, uh, but my what I would suggest to you is if you think you've got a thyroid problem, do it properly with thyroid hormones, and if you get better, then you know, yep, you've got a thyroid problem, and then maybe try um, substituting the thyroxine for iodine. Now, this is experimental. I'm not officially recommending this, but you know, every one of us is a guinea pig. Okay, uh, supply of DMSO. Yep, we stock it here. Um, at the um, on my sales of Dr. Myhill. Is it dangerous to take methylene blue and amitriptyline? Well, in theory, possibly. It depends on the dose of amitriptyline. Most people with fatigue syndromes only need maybe 10 milligrams or 25 milligrams at night. Um, so if you if you wanted to try the two together, then um, start off with very tiny doses and build up and ask yourself, am I getting headaches? You know, Check your heart, check your blood pressure because it can cause high blood pressure, um, but it's rare. Hello, Nancy. Yeah, she's in, she's in the starting block. She says it's ready to go ratting now. Um, okay, okay. Oh, Craig, thank you. Uh, uh, Guy Eshman told us about the French Library. Uh, I I try and give credit to everybody where it's due, but thank you for that, Craig. Um, can you take methylene blue without photodynamic therapy? Of course you can. Of course you can. And guess what I do. I'm very lucky because I work in my conservatory and um, and when the sun shines, you know, I'm automatically getting, because infrared goes through um, um, glass, I'm automatically getting a nice dose of infrared. And of course, when you exercise, you're producing infrared as well, because the heat generated from, from my condo is radiated as, as infrared. So just the business of keeping warm work, and you, you're going to have infrared swimming around. Um, okay, I've on that one. No, you don't need to replace the salt pipe. You don't even need to replace the salts in it. You know, this one is ancient and um, uh, it's working fine. Where can we buy safe methylene blue? I've got some on the way. Uh, Say so there was a cock up with uh, our supplier, but we've got BP73 in the pipeline. Yeah, you wouldn't want to take it like with Ritalin. In fact, we shouldn't be taking Ritalin at all. Um, is there a way to know when iodine is pharmaceutical grade? Yeah, look for BP73. Um, uh, and insist on that. That means it's the British pharmaceutical grades as laid down in 1973. Okay, what's the ideal body temperature? 37 degrees, and that's core temperature. Have you any thoughts on taking colloidal silver internally for infection? Well, um, silver in, in, in low doses, yes, that will kill some infections, but in high doses, it's potentially toxic. Uh, I remember having this conversation with Dr. Puria, who pointed out if you if you took a lot of silver, you would end, eventually end up with a toxic dose. And, um, you know, so silver is, is very good topically, but we've got iodine. You know, iodine is so safe. It does so many other good jobs, too. It's an essential for the body. Um, funnily enough, uh, on that subject, I've just been reading a fascinating book about acne by um, uh, Melissa Gallico. Now, she is she's the perfect intelligent patient because she had severe cystic acne and um, uh, didn't want to use the, the horrible drugs that dished out for acne. She wanted to know the question why. And to cut a very long story short, she did some fabulous detective work. 
Now, there are two clues here. The first clue comes from uh, Lauren Cordain, who is the first advocate of paleo diets. And he made the point in his travels around the world that when he goes to um, um, areas where there are primitive people still eating traditional primitive diets like the Maoris, like the um, Aborigines, like the Filipinos and, and so on, um, uh, and, and islands in, in South um, America, um, uh, islands in South America, um, areas of South America, the instance of um, acne is zero. There's none. All the children, all the teenagers have got beautiful skin. And so he maintained that the, the paleoketogenic diet is absolutely vital. And he's absolutely right. That is the starting point. We know allergies to foods, particularly dairy, can cause acne. Uh, but we know high carbohydrate diet causes swinging levels of blood sugar, hormones up and down, and that drives the pathology. But um, Melissa did the um, ketogenic diet to the letter and she still had cystic acne. And the last important bit of the jigsaw puzzle was fluoride. And she, again, she did some brilliant detective work. She traveled around the world as part of her job. She's a, she works for American intelligence. She's a super bright girl. Um, uh, she discovered that when she was in some countries, her acne disappeared completely. And then other places she worked, it came back with the ventions. And she taught, she trawled through all the possibilities. And what she found is when she was drinking fluoride free water, um, um, uh, not using fluoride toothpaste, um, uh, not using um, uh, what my daughters describe as concentration camp chicken, you know, uh, eating in a um, uh, factory produced chicken, which is high in fluoride. She had, uh, if she had, if she avoided fluoride, her skin cleared up completely. And uh, of course, fluoride is extremely toxic to thyroid gland. And another reason to take iodine is if there is any fluoride lurking around. And I've got, I was dosed with um, uh, uh, tetracyclines uh, for my chest as a child and given fluoride. And I've got terrible teeth as a result. You know, our kids don't have to have terrible teeth anymore. Um, if they're doing a paleoketogenic diet, no fluoride, they can have beautiful teeth. And no spots, more to the point. Okay. Um, how do you take medicinally? Just um, um, uh, yes, I'm a bit disappointed. It's extremely sweet, and I can't see on the bottle why that should be. Um, I can't believe they put sugar in it. I must ask um, um, uh, Golak about this, um, uh, uh, Joachim about this. But my guess is it's probably got some glycerine or something in there, and that's what gives it the sweet uh, flavour. But I will check that. Okay, yep, you can have all the PowerPoint stuff. That's all questions about that. Um, um, okay, I'm flipping through this. Um, uh, yep, we've got CBD oil on the um, uh, website, which is good quality CBD oil because it comes from at least 20 different uh, cannabis plants. The amazing thing about cannabis, um, it has it has fantastic medicinal properties, and I'm, I'm only just beginning to learn about it. I've got a lovely book, which I can't see now, called Medicinal, um, uh, Medicinal Cannabis and How It Can Be Used. But what I was so fascinated to learn is that there are 45,000 different um, types of cannabis plants. And that's because it has such widespread applications, so many diseases that, you know, it may well be that you know, one disease responds best to that particular plant and another disease re responds best to that particular plant. At the moment, the best we can do is trying to use uh, uh, an extract that's got as many different plants in it as possible, because the more different and the, the greater the number of different uh, cannabinoids and terpenes that are present, the better the response. It's called the, um, 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 not the cocktail effect, um, it'll come to me in a moment, um, but the more things you've got there, um, the better the effect of it, the entourage effect. Thank you, brain. Okay. Um, my Emmy was triggered by the COVID vaccine. Yup, that's an absolute disaster. And yes, uh, all this stuff will be very helpful. Um, I find if I've just working on today, um, uh, I um, and I'll put it up on the website, a strategy to treat um, vaccine generated pathology, an overall strategy to reduce the inflammation and to try and get rid of spike protein. Uh, and I'll send it to Craig and I'm sure Craig will put it up on the website for us. Okay. Um, oh, crumbs. I'm not even beginning to tackle these questions. Um, okay. I have Emmy in long COVID. Uh, he says eggs are a virus favorite food. Oh, I don't buy that. Um, what microbes love 
including glasses, they love sugar and eggs are zero carbs. So eggs would be um, a very desirable food. I love people to have eggs. I have at least two eggs a day, sometimes four, um, largely because I've got my own ducks and chickens, of course, um, but eggs are great foods. I have a parasitic infection, same protocols. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, that will work wonderfully for uh, parasites. And in fact, methylene blue, as we mentioned, was originally used to treat malaria and is still effective against malaria, which is an obvious parasite. Um, is it helpful to have infrared direct on the upper body or the waist belt be adequate? Well, the more infrared you can get over the surface, over the, over the total of your body, the better. I mean, the best is going to be sunshine, but you know, not much available at this time of year. Um, but a belt is is a very easy way to um, get a constant um, radiation with um, um, with infrared light. Okay, how much time should you leave between iodine and vitamin C? Well. Good four to six hours, I would think. What is hyperinflation? Oh, I'm not sure what hyperinflation is, except in the monetary sense. Um, possibly hyperinflation might be um, 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 cytokine storm, possibly, I think. You're thinking about that. When we get uh, a, a huge amount of inflammation, uh, so much so that it actually ends up um, killing you. The supply of the red light belt is on Amazon. Um, um, and it'll, um, and I'm ashamed to say myself, I can't remember the name of it. Um, and anyway, somebody might have one already and, and, and say, will this regime help with hypoimmunoglobulinemia? Ooh, okay, well, um, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm not sure if you mean um, low levels of gamma globulins, which of course um, means that the immune system exhausted. Uh, it will help that indirectly because um, um, we need gamma globulins. They are, what, and they are essentially antibodies. So when you measure the globulin in your blood, most of that are um, uh, immunoglobulins, and that's what we fight infection with. And if they are low, then that tells us that the immune system is exhausted. And if the immune system is exhausted, then guess what? It needs the energy to fight. It needs the raw materials to fight. And we need to do things to reduce the total infectious load so the immune system doesn't have to work so hard. So, yes, all these interventions will help people who are immunosuppressed for whatever reason. OK, how do we know we're not reaching bowel tolerance to magnesium carbonate? OK, now we don't want bowel tolerance to magnesium Um, um Oh, I see what you mean. Um, um, uh, the question is, how do you know we're not reaching balance when we've got magnesium carbonate in our vitamin C? Um, that's a good question, actually. I haven't really thought about that. Um, 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 magnesium carbonate generally just would give you, um, a, a, if you had a lot of magnesium, a soft stool and a loose stool. Whereas vitamin C, if, if you were taking bowel tolerance of vitamin C, you'd get the bloating in the wind and the foul smelling stool. So my guess is, is you'd have to um, um, do it that way. So yes, you can get diarrhea with magnesium carbonate, but you'd have to take a lot of it. And then you just get a lot of soft stools. Whereas with vitamin C, when you get diarrhea, you get the bloating, the foul smelling wind, and um, and the very obvious uh, loose diarrhea with that. So it, my guess, it should be obvious. Okay. Oh, well done, uh, Gillian. Uh, red light belt, Amazon Nebula. There, yeah, I remember the name now. Thank you, Amy. Okay, is it recommended to reduce CBD as the canna levels increase over time? Well, um, um, we, we use the CBD um, on the basis of helping symptoms. And as the symptoms decline, so you can reduce the dose of CBD. And of course, um, and hopefully if we're giving the body the energy and the raw materials, then endogenous uh, uh, cannabinoids uh, production will be, will be maintained. But again, I don't like to uh, recommend anything to anybody without trying it first with me. So I've tried taking two drops of CBD oil at night. And I think my, well, I know my sleep is better quality. So um, um, you know, perhaps I'm getting to the stage where, you know, I could do with a drop or two at night. Okay, is it okay to mix sodium bicarbonate with ascorbic acid? Yes, you can certainly do that. Um, but the trouble is if you have a lot of sodium bicarbonate, you can end up with too much sodium. The reason I like to use magnesium bicarbonate or magnesium carbonate is you do get a nice dose of magnesium as well. Uh, yet sodium carbonate is cheaper, but um, magnesium carbonate is probably safer and better in the longer term. Is fire infrared blanket suitable for use with methylene blue? Well, uh, yes. I mean, the the um, wavelength that works best is on the 
tip the cusp of, of red light and near infrared light. So the far infrared light is a longer wavelength and that's more for detoxing, but that also has other beneficial effects. So um, uh, say for activating methylene blue, it's near infrared light at six, seven, oh, nanometers. Um, it's the wavelength uh, seems to be the optimum amount. Which type of magnesium and zinc is optimal? Well, one of my patients did some lovely research on this uh, to find out the one that was um, um, uh, the best, um, most effective and the best value for money. And he came up with one called magnesium sup, which is three different magnesium. There's bisglucinate, there's malate, um, and I think citrate are the three magnesiums in there. And uh, and that is the best absorbed and probably the best value for money. So I tend to use that these days, and we've got that on the shop. What would you... Uh, suggest for chronic reflux and esophageal dysmotility. Well, reflux is part of the upper fermenting gut. And um, um, and so and we've, we've talked about the treatment of that. Uh, and, uh, and, and time-restricted eating will be very helpful for that because it allows the stomach to um, get its normal acidity. Now, esophageal dysmotility, um, that may be to do with the upper fermenting gut, but some people, um, um, some women in particular, uh, develop something called achalasia. And the cause of that is not known. It is associated with fungal infection. I've got one patient for whom I tried antifungals and it didn't really seem to help, I have to say. But my guess is that many of these problems start with the stomach and start with the upper fermenting gut. And uh, so, you know, uh, so just to say, put in place all these interventions now and see where that gets you. Okay. Hello uh, for Emily. So for CFS, I went PK following the book, got to get with the fermenting gut, added in the mitochondrial supplement, didn't see any problem. Yeah, well, I say getting well is like building a house. Uh, and we in the book, there's a, 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 a chapter about this. And when you build your house, you have to start with a foundation. And um, uh, and then you build on that foundation. You build in the walls and the ceilings and whatever. And the and the diet, the PK diet, are the foundation stones. So you put in all these other things. And if you're not getting better, then we have to add to that. So the next step will be to think thyroid and adrenal dysfunction, and uh, and that helps us to balance up energy delivery mechanisms. And if you're still not right, then we're thinking, well, there must be a hole in the energy bucket. And the commonest hole in the energy bucket is the immunological hole. So thinking allergy, um, autoimmunity, and chronic infection. For some people, they have an emotional hole in their energy bucket, and that uses up a huge amount of energy. I remember um, uh, 20 years ago um, when I was, um, uh, um, uh, I used to go very regularly to um, uh, ecological medicine meetings and there's a wonderful doctor there called Keith Eaton. Bless him, sadly he's died, but I love the man. He was, he was such a good doctor and so careful. And I remember him telling me in the late 1980s that childhood trauma is a major risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. So children who have been bullied, who've been abused, um, who've been sexually abused, who have been beaten, who have been unsafe, they are then hardwired for hypervigilance. So they don't sleep. They're constantly on red alert. And that, as I call it, you know, and that creates a post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. And that, as I call it, kicks an enormous hole in the energy bucket because the brain, like the immune system, is enormously demanding of energy. And if the brain is in constant res alert, constant anxiety, constantly looking for danger, that is exhausting. It's exhausting for lots of reasons. And another point here is I can't tell the difference between the brain and the immune system. And if the um, if the brain is angry, then the immune system is angry. If the brain is happy and chilled out, then the immune system is happy and chilled out and is a, in a much better state to deal with um, infectious stresses or, rev or whatever. So, yes, you know, I, and of course, every chronic illness has a psychological component. Now, I don't pretend to be any good at that. I recognize that it's a severe problem and there are lots of very useful psychological techniques to help people deal with that. But whatever psychological technique you choose to use, whether that's counseling or um, um, uh, cognitive behavior therapy or, or uh, emotional freedom techniques or neurolinguistic programming or whatever, or hypnosis, they are always going to work better with all these other interventions in place. So, um, and, and that's especially um, the keto diet. So um, those are the other reasons possibly why you're not making uh, uh, improvements despite doing much, 
but it doesn't mean to say you stop the interventions. You just like building house, you keep the walls in place, you keep the foundation stones in place, you keep the windows, there, you keep the roof in place, and then you start decorating the inside. But everything's got to be kept um, together. Is it safe to use iodine with low thyroid? Yes, of course. We talked about that. Um, okay, we talked about that too. Um, um, no, um, Lugal iodine is, you know, extremely safe stuff. It's the old story. Always start low and go slow. Okay. Okay. The doc says my thyroid levels are okay. Do I trust this? No, you don't. You want to know what the actual results are because the doctors look at the results and if it's in within their normal range, they'll say, oh, everything is normal. Now, as some of you are aware, I've done a book about this. It's called The Underactive Thyroid and I've been very naughty. The subtitle is do it yourself because your doctor won't. And that is the fact of the matter. Now, remember, all diagnosis is hypothesis. So to diagnose the underactive thyroid, first of all, we have to put in place the PK diet, sort out the fermenting gut and get the mitochondria um, uh, in a reasonably fit state. And the reason for that is because thyroid hormones and adrenal hormones work through their effects on mitochondria. So you've got to get the system into a, into a position where it can be, it can respond to that thyroid kick. And then we ask, have we got any symptoms of the underactive thyroid? And again, they're all detailed in the book and in various talks. And if you've got the symptoms of the underactive thyroid and the blood tests show that there is biochemical scope for a trial of thyroid glandular, then we put in place a trial of thyroid glandular. And the key is we start low and we go slow because, again, it's very easy to overshoot and miss that sweet spot. So we start with 15 milligrams of thyroid glandular, which is, I use Metaviv, which is equivalent to Metaviv 1. We take 15 milligrams daily for a week. And if all is well, pulse is good, blood pressure is good, we're feeling okay, increase the dose to um, 30 milligrams. You know, again, check the pulse, how do you feel? And we gradually increase the dose. And the target dose is weight dependent. So somebody who is, say, um, you know, um, um, uh, eight stone would need maybe 60 milligrams of thyroid glandular to normalize, whereas somebody who is 16 stone might need 180 milligrams of thyroid glandular to normalize. Um, and so we uh, and again, the, the details of the dosing are in the book. Now, if you are much better for doing that and if you're improved, then the diagnosis is made retrospectively because you have responded well to that treatment. At that point, you say, yes, it's the thyroid that's the issue. And most people end up on that dose of thyroid you know, for life. Although we've, we've talked about replacing it with iodine. I'm not sure about that. Um, that's still uh, something that we are trying. OK. Um, I've recently found out that vitamin C is mild oxalate. It's not this mild oxalate. It's just that it is metabolized to oxalate. And that the only department where vitamin C can be a problem there are women who have irritable bladders, interstitial cystitis, uh, vulvodynia. That seems to be a particular problem to them. But um, um, I would be uh, that would be the only reason for maybe not tolerating ascorbic acid. Bit off topic, my deeper asked you, melatonin made me feel suicide a very low dose. Oh, gosh, um, that's rotten luck. Um, 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 and I don't know about agomelatine. I've not, um, um, I'm not aware of that. I can't, I mean, um, that's extraordinary about melatonin. Um, maybe um, balance that up with, maybe instead of trying melatonin, take 5-HTP. Because um, 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan um, is the raw material from which you make serotonin, which is said to be you know, the happy neurotransmitter, and uh, that then goes on to melatonin. On that note, interestingly, uh, Melissa Gallico, fluoride, she noticed that when she was her, her acne was bad, she also had severe depression, not because the acne was bad, but as another side effect of the fluoride. And again, she noticed that when she was in areas where she was fluoride free, her mood was so much better. So again, it's another little clinical clue I picked up from interesting reading the last few weeks. I'm always on a steep learning curve. I've never not been on a steep learning curve. And I seem to get the impression it's getting steeper. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, teeth and ascorbic acid. Yeah, you don't want ascorbic acid to hang around your teeth for too long. So if you do drink ascorbic acid, then just rinse your mouth um, with a mouth of water to get rid of that. OK, and now there's a complicated question here. I have scarring alopecia. 
Well, my guess is that's a combination, and this is a guess, of, of acne and autoimmunity because alopecia is an autoimmune disorder. Um, okay, so that would be um, um, complicated, but um, you, um, you very generously said that your sugar addiction is a challenge. Bless you. Um, one of the most useful ways um, to get onto the PK diet is to realize that sugar and carbohydrates are horribly addictive. Now, believe you me, I'm an addict. I'm the best addict in the world. Both my parents died from uh, alcohol-related addiction diseases, um, and I know I could happily become an alcoholic. I know I'm not because I can have the occasional glass of, of, of I tend to drink a cider or gin these days. I have the occasional glass and I just need a glass and I'm a happy bunny and I don't need any more. And I go weeks without having any alcohol. So that, that tells you I'm not an alcoholic, but I know I could be a sugar addict. You know, I love things like um, figs and prunes, but if I have them in the larder, I can't leave them alone. You know, they all just disappear and I, I don't feel well for it. So um, so um, recognizing that sugar is an addiction and getting off all of it is what you've got to do. Now, very often the prospect of doing that is worse than the actual doing of it. And uh, this is where continuous glucose monitoring can be very helpful. This is where um, checking your um, ketones by breath testing can be very helpful because um, it tells you when you are straying. Um, so to keep on the straight and narrow, having some objective measure of where you're at um, is often helpful. Um, but my guess is you need to do groundhog chronic. And from what I've recently learned, make sure you haven't got any um, fluoride around because uh, that's going to make it worse. And and then, yes, get up to speed with the iodine, get up to speed with the um, 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 vitamin C. Psoriasis is an interesting one. I found a lovely paper um, some months ago, uh, which was case histories. Now, often you get the best information from case histories because these are people who have um, like um, Melissa Gallico have done it, been there and worked it out for themselves. These were six cases of patients who had se quite severe psoriasis. And all they did was they took big dose of vitamin D. And all six cases, um, the psoriasis completely resolved. Now, by big doses, I mean up to 30,000 IU daily. Now, I like people to take 10,000 IU daily. Now, the point about 10,000 IU daily is there has never in the history of vitamin D been any toxicity from that sort of dose. Um, some doctors uh, believe that giving 20,000 IU of vitamin D is perfectly safe so long as you're not having any dairy products because the only toxicity of, of vitamin D is hypercalcemia. The calcium goes too high. So these patients who are taking 30,000, I think one took 50,000, they had to have their serum calcium monitored. Now that's a bit of a bore, that's a blood test. Um, but what was so interesting is that in all cases, the serum calcium remained absolutely normal. None of them developed hypercalcemia. But the point here is that vitamin D is a very good treatment for psoriasis. And guess what we also know? I mean, one of the most important treatments for psoriasis, a topical treatment, is something called calcipotriol, which is, uh, or Dovonex, which is the drug company's form of vitamin D. It's a form of vitamin D that you apply topically uh, to the rash directly, and that works very well. So what that tells us is that psoriasis is a vitamin D issue. And if you can get the dose right, then there's a good chance you can clear it. I also know that psoriasis has many fungal associates. It's also fungal driven. And so again, um, the PK diet, vitamin C and iodine to get rid of iod um, uh, fungi from the gut is going to be additionally helpful. So it's the old story, we have to do it all. And whatever your starting point is, whatever your disease is, whether you want, just want to prevent disease or if you've got autoimmunity or if you've got skin problems or, or whatever, then these regimes are the starting point. The paleoketogenic diet, vitamin C, iodine, add in the micronutrients, sort out the mitochondria, and on you go. Does it hurt to take out-of-date iodine? Well, since iodine has been in the ground of an element for the last four and a half billion years, it's not going to go out of date. So the answer is yes, of course it is. Okay, I take prophylactic septin for haemolophilus lung infection. The iodine salt pipe works brilliantly well. So Sally, you know, um, uh, septrin will mess up your gut flora like nothing else. And septrin is quite a toxic drug. And there have been um, cases of aplastic anemia, bone marrow suppression as a result of septrin long term. 
So what would be safe in that would be trimethoprim because it's the sulfonamide content that makes cetrin so toxic. But um, sniff iodine regularly, and I can tell you that will do the trick. Okay, my uh, very kind of you. Thank you. Um, um, does neuroplasticity work have any role in that? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, um, what we do know about the brain is that it is plastic. In fact, throughout life, the brain makes a million new connections every second. Um, it's fantastically plastic um, uh, um, organ, and you know, it's more complicated. It's got more um, synapses and connections in it than all the stars in the universe. You know, it is um, you know it's, it's extraordinary organ, and it's developing all the time as so we learn new things, um, and it prunes out neuro. As if, we, if we don't need information, it prunes them out. If we do need information, then it reinforces them, and so then that's called neuroplasticity. So. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> oh, Elaine Morgans. Thank you. The aquatic ache hypothesis. Thank you, Marion. Quite right, too. Not Elaine Jones. I knew it was a friend. I knew it was a Welsh name. <laughs> OK. Can you take methylene blue with Liz Dex? Oh, I think that's an amphetamine. I don't like the sound of that. We shouldn't be using amphetamines. That is symptom suppression. Um, it's like having you know, six cups of coffee all at once. Um, um, and again, if anybody has any sleep disorder, no caffeine, um, no amphetamines, because they have long half lives and they will disturb your sleep. OK, if you have adrenaline insufficiency, well, I, adrenaline insufficiency, I'm not sure I, I, I recognize that. Maybe adrenal insufficiency is what you're talking about and are almost diabetic. Well, if you're almost diabetic, the paleoketogenic diet, I can guarantee 100% it will reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, there's two aspects of type 2 diabetes. First of all, um, we have to reduce the carbohydrates because obviously if we're eating sugars and carbohydrates, that will spike your blood sugar. And the second thing is we have to improve insulin sensitivity. And um, there are three supplements which uh, improve that markedly. One is benfetamine, that's, uh, which is uh, the lipid-soluble version of, of vitamin B1, and the dose of that would be one gram daily. In fact, it's a wonderful commentary by Stuart Lindsay in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine. Again, if any of you, um, uh, all of you guys, sign up to the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine, ask their newsletter. It's a fabulous resource. It's free. It costs nothing. It's run by a brilliant um, uh, uh, orthomolecular doctor called Andrew Saul. Uh, and guess what? I'm on the editorial panel, so another reason to get it. Uh, but they've got some fantastically useful information there. And there's a great article recently by Stuart Lindsay, who calls himself something like the recalcitrant pharmacologist or, or the doubting pharmacologist or, or, or something like that. But he reversed his type 2 diabetes just with um, thiamine uh, one gram daily. So that's important. Also, um, um, chromium. You need chromium. Glucose tolerance factor. It's, it's, it's an, uh, uh, um, uh, also, I think it's glucose tolerance factor. But anyway, chromium, uh, half a milligram a day. And of course, there's chromium in the sunshine salt. And then carnitine. Um, these things help insulin sensitivity. Uh, so if you're struggling with ketosis or struggling with the diet, then those are three very useful useful supplements. Okay, did I hear it right? Yes, methylene blue and two grams of vitamin C, wait a couple of hours, and yes, you can drink it without staining. Okay, um, I've had constant internal tremors in my core for six months with long COVID. Now, that's a, such an interesting symptom, and I do occasionally hear that, and I don't know what the mechanism of that is. Um, um, what I'd be fascinated to know is if they are perceived or if they are actual. And the way you could work that out um, is if you lie in a bath of water um, um, and lie very still in that bath of water. And if you're getting ripples on the surface, then that tells us that that constant internal tremor is a real movement that you are perceiving um, that you that is in there. If you if the surface of the water is at, stays absolutely still, then that's a perception thing that your brain is perceiving something that isn't actually there. A little bit like um, phantom limb syndrome, for example. But I don't know if that's indication of chronic infection. I don't know what the mechanism of it that that causes that to you, Katie. But um, put in place all these interventions and see if it goes away. Okay, what do I should I brush my teeth with if I need to eat fluoride? Well, that's easier, fluoride-free toothpaste. 
Um, some people make up their own with salt and uh, sodium bicarbonate, and that works very well as well. Okay. Um, okay, Emma's disappeared. Thank you. Um, the medicinal cannabis book. Oh, um, I haven't got a link for it. Um, and I can't remember the name of the author. There are two authors, um, um, but it's it's just called medicinal cannabis, and you'll get it. You'll see it on um, uh, um, um, Amazon. Yep, Entourage Fact. Thank you, Charles. Okay, well, we are racing towards eight o'clock. Um, this is my fourth webinar that I've done today, and the other two are an hour and a half each. So um, I've just about had enough. If I don't take Nancy for a walk, she will go and strike, and none of us will none of us will sleep. But thank you for your kind comments, and um, um, if you think these are helpful, we will run them again. And um, so give us some feedback. And um, uh, we'll ask Martin to put this up, or Craig to put this up on um, Facebook, not Facebook, um, YouTube. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. I'm going to say good night to everybody and um, uh, go for my evening walk and then dive into my bed with my two drops of uh, CBD oil. So good night and thank you so much for joining me and uh, hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>